Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I am your host and producer. My name is James Pagoshnik. Thank you guys so much for listening. And on the other end of the tin can and string, we have our analyst and co-host. You know him from numerous blogs and podcasts around the internet, most notably from TheAthletic.com. He is useful human Arif Hassan. Arif, how you doing tonight? I'm good, man. How are you? I am uh, I am doing well, but cold. This uh, this early snow stuff is for the birds, and I'm hoping that uh, it doesn't impede upon my attempt at uh, at spending some time in Minneapolis doing the thing I love the most in this world, which is car shopping. Oh, hooray! Hooray! I there's nothing more fun than than being than the high pressure sales positions and going through all sorts of fun car lots full of all sorts of hail damaged vehicles and sitting there just going, how the hell am I going to get this damn thing home? I'm so looking forward to it. This is going to be fun. Also, there's a Vikings game this weekend against the Eagles, and I'm trying to <laughs> mentally like do something else so I don't have to. Be, I realize we have to cover it, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to trying to get a, a different, you know, a part of my life. If I'm going to hurt this much, I'm going to do it to myself. <laughs> Oprah calls that empowerment. Oprah does call that empowerment. <laughs> so welcome to the show. We are going to uh, spend a good amount of time talking about the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, there will be a 38-7 reference somewhere in the uh, in the interview, so look forward to that. Uh, but before we uh, do anything like that, we uh, just want to thank you guys so much for listening, uh, for sharing uh, links to the website or sharing links to the podcast, uh, all of that, being on social media with us. Again, thank you guys so much. If you enjoy the show, hear value in what we're doing, you can donate to the show in one or two different ways. You can go to patreon.com slash Norse code, or you can go to paypal.me slash Norse code and, uh, and donate to the show there. You can do so in any amount that you'd like. The Patreon is, of course, of subscription-based, so you can do $1 a month, Tree Fitty to help keep the Loch Ness Monster at bay, stuff like that. Again, we really do uh, appreciate everything you guys have done for the show, and we will continue to uh, be as good to you in the future. Uh, we also would like to mention that in two weeks, uh, Thursday, October 18th, we will be at Bar None in uh, Manhattan in New York City, uh, taping a live show. So if you find yourself in the uh, greater Manhattan area, you can go to Bar None in, uh, in New York uh, Thursday, October 18th, uh, likely about uh, 9 o'clock at night. We will be uh, taping, kind of getting things together for, uh, for doing a little live show. So uh, please come out and uh, support us. We'll have some stickers out there too, some, uh, some Norse Code swag. So uh, check us out. We will uh, we'll definitely be appreciative of any and all uh, support and just people pointing and going, is that a reef? Wow, that is an impressive beard, isn't it? Yep, stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, we will be in New York. So please, uh, please check us out, and uh, and all that. So, Arif, let's get into uh, let's get into our interview, shall we? All right. And as promised, we have a special guest to uh, to bring on. We we've decided to retire Ben Natan for uh, for the moment. He is still on suspension from the last time he was brought on, after which the Vikings lost the NFC Championship game. So we will be bringing on special guest. His uh, his name is Michael Kist. He is from Bleeding Green Nation Radio. He is also a writer at BGN, the uh, SB Nation site for the Philadelphia Eagles, and he is a scout for the Inside the Pylon. Uh, welcome to the show, Michael. How you doing? I am. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. This is the second day in a row I've had to talk with Arif, and uh, I'm going to have a stern word with my agent. And uh, but yeah, otherwise, man, I'm I'm great. Man, I, how are you? I I feel you. I, I totally yeah. feel you on this. Uh, so uh, we wanted to ask a, a very important question uh, about the fan base of the Eagles because we're worried about them, quite frankly. Uh, as somebody who experiences way too much Eagles love in his Facebook timeline due to my uh, geographical location, uh, I see so many sad Eagles memes, so many just sad Eagles fans. It's almost, uh, you guys are at such a downtrodden organization. I worry about you guys. What's the temperature of the Eagles fan, uh, Eagles uh, fan base out there? There was this illusion that winning was going to cure everything with this fan base. And I don't think that's, that's true at all. Like the, uh, everything in the summer and the draft was like, ah, we don't care. We won the Super Bowl. Everything's great. Draft a tight end. It's cool. So on and so forth. And then you get to the season and you know, the games start to matter and we go to two and two and 
everything now is falling apart. Every every article I write for Bleeding Green Nation, everyone's freaking about the oh, offensive line is terrible and it's all gloom and doom and and everyone wants to jump off of a bridge. This is this is, it's it's so weird. It's so weird. So no, the Eagles fans have definitely not changed their colors, even though they have a, a Super Bowl ring now. And I was talking with uh, Mark Schofield actually of Inside the Pilot about this, and he's a Patriots fan. He covers the Patriots, and he's like, it hasn't changed uh, Patriots fan one bit either. If anything, it has made them worse. So success does not change everything. Uh, so Vikings fans, you're not missing out on a whole lot other than like like eight <laughs> really awesome months. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Well, I'm glad, yeah, that's that's exactly what Vikings fans wanted to hear. This that feels great. Thank you. Uh, no problem. I'll do what yeah. I can. What was it? Father, lover, sinner, saint, little bitch, Michael Kiss. Is that? <laughs> I'm a father. I'm a lover. I'm a gentle lover. I'm a gentle lover. <laughs> All right. No, well, okay. Let's talk about the Eagles. Um, let's talk about Good King Wenceslas. Uh, how is he doing, man? Wentz was rusty the first week that he came back and he was a little uh, jacked up emotionally in the first quarter, you could tell, but he's always kind of had that to his game or he would make some, some overthrows. He's like the inverse of Donovan McNabb who always throw all the, throw all those warm burners early yeah. in games. Awesome. He goes high. Yeah. So uh, he was a little rusty. He missed some reads in the middle portions of the game that, that stalled some drives out on, on some third downs. It just uh, uh, wasn't exactly in tune with everything around him in the second game against the Titans. He looked perfectly fine. I think it was, some other protection issues that broke down and, you know, some, some penalties. And then the defense broke down towards the second half of the game when they were trying to throttle it down. But in the second game, he, he was on with, he was on with his deep ball outside of the first one that drifted a little bit outside for him. Uh, he was hitting the short stuff. He was, he was scrambling around. He was looking, he was looking good. He's right now. He, I think he's taking too many sacks because he's not seeing things as fast as he was seeing them last year. But as far as, if are we concerned that Carson Wentz won't be the same Carson Wentz because of the of the knee injury? He's moving around just fine. It doesn't seem like anything is in his head about it. So, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I think everything will be fine with Wentz, and he'll continue to get better. Well, so you mentioned that you know he might be holding out of the ball too long, might be you know creating additional pressure, might be grabbing some sacks. That was a criticism of him his rookie year. He seemed to kind of resolve it near the end of his rookie year, especially with those pressures turning into sacks. Uh, and then you know obviously you know, last year that, that seemed to kind of fade away. This seems like a reemergence of an issue. Are you maybe concerned that, uh, you know, that might kind of reinstitute itself? Or do you think just like, as he continues to get game reps, the speed will catch up to him? Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's a great point. I think it's a valid point. It's something definitely to track, but right now, you know, the evidence has shown that he can move past that as he did last year to get a little more on the plus side of that. And there are other things that this offense can do and has done before if necessary to lower that time to throw like they did with Nick Foles in the, in the playoff run, they lowered Nick Foles' time to throw by 0.2 seconds. And a lot of that was by design. So if it needs to get that way with Wentz and they need to bring things in a little bit for him and give him some more to find read some quicker RPO stuff, whatever the case needs to be. This coaching sh- staff has also shown that they can adjust to that as well. All right. So, uh, you know, what, one thing that I think it, it feels like, and I think, uh, it might've been, uh, your partner in crime, Benjamin Solak, uh, might've right. been, uh, someone else, but I saw someone mention that, oh, actually it might've actually been Robert Mays, uh, who mentioned that there's just been a, a bunch of small regressions kind of across the rest of the offense. And, you know, obviously expecting ones to play at an MVP level again, especially so soon after injury uh, might be asking a little bit much. So he might regress through kind of no fault of his own. Um, Does it feel like, you know, a bunch of the individual units around the offense have kind of taken a step back? Well, I mean, look at what we're dealing with at wide receiver right now. And we just got Alshon Jeffrey back. And as soon as we get Alshon Jeffrey back, I, I think he has a point because Nelson Aguilar had one of his trademark 2016 games at the same time. So, you know, we get a plus and then we get a big negative to go along with it too. Other than that, you know, I think the offensive line has struggled a bit and they are showing some vulnerability to stunts and some blitzes and they're getting confused. there. a big part of that too, is the, the running back stable being beat up. So there is a regression there, but it's also due to injury. Uh, For instance, a lot of things that we're going to see 
against the Vikings that the Titans did to us, double mugging the the A gap. And, you know, the running back is a key piece of that protection plan there. Well, when Corey Clement is out and Corey Clement was the one dealing with those type of protections in the NFC championship game and did a really good job against them. And now you have Wendell Smallwood against the Titans and he can't do it. He just doesn't have the mental processing for it. The play speed uh, isn't that good at protection. Then, yeah, you're going to see a step back from there as well. Uh, As far as I would say running back pass protection. Yeah, but that's more due to injury. Pass catching, yeah, mm-hmm. but the same thing because Darren Sproles has been out. The running game has been fine. The red zone running is actually experience, experiencing a positive regression to the mean from last year, and they mm-hmm. perform better in the red zone, higher success rates. They're converting more, you know, with the five and in with the Jai and whatnot. Wide receivers, Mike Wallace is out. Mm-hmm. You know, Mac Hollins is out. Alshon Jeffrey came in and balled out, but Nelly had that bad game. Tight ends has been good, uh, and the offense line has struggled a little bit. I don't think it's I don't think it's that big of a deal. It's just a matter of being healthy at the same time. That's what this team right. really needs. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, let, let's talk a little bit about some of those individual cases you brought up. Who is the real Nelson Aguilar? Oh, he's a Nelson from from last year. I okay. mean, you know, you, you get a game where he has three drops, and and the first drop was on that first deep pass, and mm-hmm. it. The six inches, I think, makes the difference in that catch. And Nelson last year showed that he had the mental toughness and the confidence to get over these types of things. In the first three games, he was perfectly fine being one of the primary targets along with Zach Ertz. And in training camp, he was absolutely uncoverable. So I think that I don't see Nelson regressing back to the the shell of a player that he was right. you know, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you mentioned Matt Collins. He's he was one of my favorite draft prospects from that class really sucked that he went to the Eagles. Um, but you know, my thoughts are that, you know, he was kind of on the verge of a breakout season last year. Uh, and, uh, and, and this year it felt like, you know, maybe he had the potential to grab uh, a starting position with the Eagles, at least in the three wide. Do you think that if he's healthy, that's kind of where he could be? Absolutely. Especially with Mike Wallace out and even without Mike Wallace going out, my thought going into the season was they're not just going to hand reps to Mike Wallace. Mike Wallace is going to have to come out and produce because if he doesn't, then they're definitely going to try Mac Holland some more. And he started earning more snaps towards the end of last year. He had some mental errors, some technical deficiencies, but you could obviously see that the raw skill, the raw talent was there and the team likes him. So if he can get back healthy and come back, you know, around week eight or maybe a little bit past that, whatever the case may be, he's dealing with the growth injury, then I think that he definitely has the opportunity to take some very important reps and get some meaningful production. And that would be great for the Eagles to have two outside threats that they could uh, depend on. Uh, and then um, one name that it's kind of fascinating that he's back with the Eagles, Jordan Matthews. Uh, what are your thoughts? Because it felt like he had such a good moment in time, I guess, with the Eagles for just like a, a brief kind of flash Uh, He ends up getting traded. He ends up getting, I think, cut. Um, And then, you know, New England side. So you know, he he goes to Buffalo. He goes to New England. Mm -hmm. He's back with Philadelphia. What are your thoughts on him? I I think he's an average wide receiver. Uh, Hands are a little shaky. He's he's solid after the catch. He can do things out of the slot. He know he knows the offense really well. He's got good chemistry with with Carson Wentz. I mean, the the fifty six yard touchdown that he had last week that was that was uh, something that they had schemed up against quarters coverage, and they got exactly what they were looking for. And it just mm-hmm. happens that that it worked out that way. But you know, he's a high volume slot guy that really isn't going to make those explosive plays with any kind of sustainability. I don't see him being a long-term piece to this offense Mm -hmm. uh, once the depth issues resolve themselves via guys returning from injuries, but he's solid. I have, you know, he's, he's a decent piece and he, and he's pretty trustworthy outside of some of the drops, but you know, he's a solid player. All right. And then uh, let's go back. Uh, Let's talk about this tight end. So first round tight end uh, Dallas Goddard, kind of a surprise for a lot of people because Zach Ertz has been so productive uh, at least as a, as a pass catching tight end. Uh, do you think that we're already beginning to kind of see maybe the returns on investment for having two high tier tight ends? I mean, obviously the Eagles have you know experience with that with Trey Burton, but you know this is kind of a different level of investment. Well, corrections and omissions, we traded back in the first round, and grabbed him in the second round. Oh, okay. uh, did, we did with Dallas Goddard. Sorry about that. So uh, <laughs> Dal- Dallas Sh- should have been a first rounder. He's good. Yeah, no, he's he's doggone good. And the the funny thing about him is even though the production hasn't been huge outside of the week three game, which I'll talk about in a second, he is a dog. 
in the run game. Like he can, re- he lined up uh, in line for, for the Jack rabbits 209 times last year. They, they had mm-hmm. him lined up like that. So they can really have some formation flexibility and run some no huddle when they go 12, you know, personnel with two tight ends. And in that Colts game, they came out in that game. They were in no huddle all first drive. They were in 13 personnel. They spread it out. They went, you know, double wing. They did all these different types of things. And Dallas Goddard ended it with a, with a touchdown on a variation of a spot concept that was beautifully drawn up. So he can, he can do that portion of it. And then what happened was the Colts adjusted from being in base personnel when they understood that they couldn't stop uh, the 12 and 13 personnel sets with base. They went to nickel. And so what the Eagles did was they ran 18 times for 155 to- uh, 100, 150, 115 yards. There we go. Against nickel from that 12 and 13 personnel for the rest of the game. And a lot of that was behind Goddard. So even though if you don't see him blowing up the, the stat sheets in week one and two, where they barely used him in the week four, where they primarily used him as a blocker, he is working out uh, absolutely fine. And I love the flashes that he's shown. He's going to be a reliable piece for us for a long time to come. Yeah, so it sounds like, so like the dream of like a two tight end set, you know, aside from having like a, a moral uh, Aaron Hernandez and a healthy Rob Gronkowski, uh, the dream seems to be uh, you've got, you know, this great kind of running back, uh, like friendly formation that you can mm-hmm. run basically at a heavy, you have the ability to run the ball, but then also you have the ability to throw the ball. The problem I think with, with the second part of the equation for a lot of teams that want to invest in multiple tight end sets is that those tight ends aren't very good between the twenties. They can't really do a bunch of open field stuff. And it sounds like, uh, you know, Ertz certainly is capable of that, but, but Goddard might be capable of that as well. Is that, uh, kind of the, the idea behind specifically picking like Goddard? instead of waiting on a tight end in a pretty tight end rich class. Yeah, yeah, they wanted some talent there so they could roll out 12 because they like using 12 and 13 even the year before with Brett Selleck and Trey Burton. So that was a winning formula for them. They threw the second highest percent out of 12 personnel last year at 57 percent just behind the Chiefs. Andy Reid coaching tree in effect there. So they obviously believe in it and they wanted somebody that they could definitely trust and plug and and play in that way. So, yeah, I having the versatility and the flexibility with your formations and not tipping off your formations. I mean, look at, look at the teams we do. We just played uh, the Titans in their two, their 12 personnel. They, they run it a bunch and they have Luke stalker out there lined out wide. Like that doesn't scare anyone. That's not going to make you change your personnel or your game plan or anything like that. Like Joe Smith and Luke stalker. That's, that's nothing a uh, week before you got Jack Doyle and uh, uh, Eric Ebron couldn't play. So it's all it's it like, it, mm-hmm. That doesn't scare anyone. Dallas Goddard and Zach Ertz moving forward. That's going to be something that teams are going to have to adjust for. And it's going to put them in a bind. A few years down the road, uh, Ertz contract comes up. Do you keep him? Whoo, boy, you're asking, you're asking, a, <laughs> you're asking a lot. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I think he's, I think he's fantastic. I, I think he, he's, He's so underrated what he does at the top of his routes and the ability that he has to tilt, you know, defenders at the break point. And, and his, his, he's not the greatest blocker, but he, he can do enough. And we don't know if like Goddard's going to be a very solid piece. I don't know if he's going to be like that dynamic red zone threat where you can trust him for eight or nine touchdowns a year. Like I think you can with Zach Ertz. Uh, however, we are going to see about that. If he is, then we have a very interesting discussion. And then you talk about, you know, you're going to have to extend Dallas Goddard. How much money do you want tied up in the tight end position? So that is a bit of a pickle. It's a bit of a pickle, Rick, for sure. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, and then I think kind of one of the things that, you know, a, a lot of people are talking about this offensive line. Uh, you know, it was it was kind of one of the kind of hidden reasons for success, maybe uh, for the Eagles last year until uh, until Jason Peters went down. He's back. Um, but it seems like at least as a run blocker, he's not doing as well if PFF isn't lying to me anyway. <laughs> uh, and uh, and as a pass protector, you know, Lane Johnson seems to be giving up pressure and stuff like that. Uh, what's the issue with because, I mean, PFF seems to like the pass protection capabilities on the interior. So what's the issue at tackle and like? Why? I mean, these are two premier all pro quality tackles. What's the problem? Yeah, I was just talking with uh, Trey Thomas, who's a longtime Philadelphia Eagle, three time pro bowler today about Jason Peters. And we were talking about, you know, he's got the MCL tear, the ACL tear that he's coming back from. He's up there in age. He's also been dealing with a quad injury. So he's been fighting through that and it has hampered his athleticism. Now, I don't know if that's the only thing, if it's just the quad 
making him a little bit slower on the take or if that's something that's going to continue after the quad injury kind of alleviates itself. But it's definitely a concern because he has he does hasn't shown the movement skills that he has shown in the past. Now, if he gets back to full health, he's one of the best doggone tackles in the game. So then, you're, you know, you're, you're feeling pretty good about that. But uh, then at right tackle, Elaine Johnson's been mostly fine. They're mostly getting beat on stunts, other than the one Harold Landry sack, which I've never seen in my life. Lane Johnson. Is the one where he like, like bends <laughs> like like to fifteen degrees to the ground. That Harold Landry sack. Yeah, yeah, the yep, the strict <laughs> strip sack. That thing was absurd. I'm a big Harold Landry fan, so it was like it was okay for my brand, but you know, don't tell <laughs> Eagles fans that. But. But other than that, like it's mostly been stunts. The Colts held a lot. And if it wasn't for like Lane throwing his arms up on one and really selling one, uh, it would have never been called all game. So that was part of it. But the communication on the line has got to be better. They got to pass stunts off a little bit better. It'll concern me more this week if they're unable to do it against the Vikings and deal with those types of issues, because then it's a it's a three week problem as far as a, instead of a two week problem. I, I think those are things that they have on film now. They understand they've been bad at dealing with them. Um, they get together as a group and they fix them. Uh, so I feel like it's more of a group effort at that point than it is maybe individual performance when it comes to Lane Johnson. When healthy, this seems like it might be the most athletic offensive line in the NFL. Do you think that's the case? I absolutely do. And another guy that's dealing with an, a little bit of a knock on his knee is, is Jason Kelsey. who's probably the most mm-hmm. athletic center in, in the NFL. I mean, right. I, I did this with, with Lane Johnson, you know, you go to Mac mock draftable and you pull up the, the spider charts of their athletic. Yeah, it's like a circle. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So you fill it out and the more it's filled out, the more athletic you are. So I converted Lane Johnson to a defensive back and I put his spider chart <laughs> next, next to Kelvin Benjamin's. And I was like, I think Lane could lock down Kelvin <laughs> Benjamin. <laughs> Cover me. <laughs> But yeah, even, and, and even on the, the interior, you know, Wisniewski's not a bad mover and, you know, Kelsey is fantastic. And then Brandon Brooks for a big dude can really get after it. So, yeah, yeah I would say the more underrated athletically oh. offensive lineman uh, it, to, to come through the league, I think. Yeah, so slept on. So, yeah, I absolutely think that this is one of, if not the premier athletic offensive lines in the league. So what what benefits does that does that provide, do you think, for the Eagles specifically? Yeah, for them, they run a lot of a lot of zone concepts to where you got to have that lateral movement to to get out into space and make those blocks and pick guys up and get to the second level. And and for Jason Kelsey, you know, he's going to have to reach middle linebackers at the second level as the play stretches horizontally against guys that are sprinting. So he's got to be able to get out and get there in the screen game. It helps you a lot. And then, you know, extra effort plays they are getting out there and they're and they're making plays for you. But they can pull. They can wham. They can they they get up on the second level. They're really quick. They beat you with quickness. Like for instance, a lot of middle linebackers, they want to on the smaller side, they want to beat you with speed. They want to beat you to the spot. It's really hard to do that against this line. When they run wham, where they let that three tech or that one tech go and they instantly go to the linebacker, they're on you. They're super fast. So it's, it's hard to beat them to the spot. You have to be able to out physical them because they're going to be in the, in the, in the spot they need to be in. All right, so let's turn it a little bit and talk. What does it look like if this offense fails? Is it because a ton of pressure has come up off the edges and, and maybe there's a problem there? Is it because the receivers keep you know, dropping passes? Does Carson Wentz uh, maybe kind of look a little shaky? What does it look like if the offense just isn't getting it done, do you think? What's the most likely sort of path to failure? Yeah, I mean, it has been drops. I think they're third in percentage for drops this year. So that has been part of the issue. Uh, the other part of the issue that you're going to see is Wentz not taking the easy stuff, which I'm still not fully confident that he's 100 uh, percent in tune and comfortable with taking that easy stuff like he was last year. So maybe he holds on to the ball a little bit longer. And of course, holding on to the ball a little bit longer mm-hmm. invites pressure. And, you know, this line not being able to deal with the, some stunts and some blitzes right now that you get some extra pressure pressure amped up and they're coming from different angles with the communication. You might not be picking up that blitz off the edge, which makes it harder for ones to escape the pocket that way. And it closes down some of the exits. Uh, that would be part of it for me. And, and then this, and then the penalties, just the dumb execution penalties. This team has been a little bit sloppy when it comes to that. It's killed some of their drives. So really just bad execution, not taking the easy stuff, dropping some footballs and then not being able to deal with the blitzes and the stunts that we had talked about. Who on the Vikings defense do you think, is most likely to kind of ruin the day for the Eagles. It sh- it should be Harrison Smith, and that's what you would think coming into the. the to, and I'm mm-hmm. sorry to bring it up, but the NFC Championship. Yeah, game. yeah. 
but the, <laughs> but they, but they kind of attacked him and used his aggressiveness against him because they knew certain things that he, you know, certain candy that he liked. They presented that for him and they worked off that. So if we're talking about if they're going to do that again, then you're going to have to come and bring pressure and get to Carson Wentz, which is something that the Minnesota Vikings have struggled a little bit to do. And, you know, the, the pressure rates are somewhere around, I want to say, 33%, 30%, 31% in the last three weeks after having a 50% in, in week one. So they haven't been getting home. The, obviously, the absence, the unfortunate absence of Everson Griffin has has been a problem. But if they can get immediate pressure and if they can get Sheldon Richardson lined up on Steve, Stephen Wisniewski, who can be uh, bullied around a little bit, we saw it with Jarrell Casey last week, then I think they have a path to uh, disrupt what the Eagles want to do offensively. Uh, so let's switch sides. Uh, we just talked about pressure. Uh, let's talk about the pressure from the d- defensive line. feels like they're getting more pressure this year than last year, which is kind of a, a nuts thing to say. That's kind of my impression. I think the numbers back that up. I'm not super sure about that. Um, but the fact that they're getting no pre- uh, getting uh, a ton of pressure, whether or not it's more of the same or a little bit less, doesn't seem to matter all that much this year. It seems like there's uh, a lot more blown coverages. I know that uh, you're just watching the Titans game. I think uh, Mariota, who one of my followers called the stranger because he couldn't feel his left hand. Uh, (laughs) It's just amazing. Um, I I know that Mariota was let down by receivers who were, you know, wide open uh, Mm -hmm. and he either, you know, the, you know, they, they, they couldn't like finish the job from Johnny Smith drops, Corey Davis drops, et cetera. And that means that they were open and available for targets. Uh, and, and, and that, you know, should be concerning, right? So there's some problems in the secondary. I know Solak wrote about uh, how they've tried to adjust for, for an injury that they had in the secondary with a Tampa two robber, which the Vikings uh, actually do use a lot. Um, but does it just feel like the back end is failing what the front end can create? Yeah, and, and the offenses are taking advantage of that, and they know they can because no quarterback has gone over 2.4 seconds to throw average against this defense, and they're still creating. I, I believe they're still – they should be top five in pressures. I know they were the number one team heading into the week. They've got a higher sack rate. So the, the defense is, is getting there, but when, like, for instance, we played the Tampa Bay Buccaneers <laughs> – Ryan Fitzpatrick gets it out in 2.21 seconds because he can hit the third step and he can get it out on a curl because we're playing all this off coverage. You can exploit them that way. And then you have it. We we think, okay, maybe we need to run more of that inverted cover to get more underneath zones because teams are trying to get the ball out quick. But the problem is you have a guy like Rodney McLeod. He comes out of the lineup. You can kind of trust with those things because it's not necessarily an inverted cover two or, or whatever. It's kind of like a cover three robber where he can still have that deep responsibility, depend on what's what's happening in front of him. I trust him more with those types of things. So they ran that coverage so much last week. And the problem with that is Mills and Darby are not accustomed to overlapping zones in that manner. They're not accustomed to that deep zone type of coverage that also encompasses the middle of the field. I charted this on on 46 dropbacks, including sacks. By the time that the ball came out or the time of the sack, exactly 50 percent of the time, a cornerback was the deepest defender on that defense. For me, it's like way too high and you're inviting those deep throws to the middle of the field. You're going to shoot your safety up all the time. So there's been issues with playing off coverage, too much cushion. And now we're giving even more cushion because those two cornerbacks have to play half field deep, which is wild to me. It obviously didn't work out and you obviously want to see it change soon. Was it a mistake to let 31 year old Patrick Robinson walk back to his old team where he was bad? No, no. You know, Patrick Robinson did a fantastic job for us in the slot last year. Uh, I don't think he would solve any or any of our issues at at outside corner. Sidney Jones Mm -hmm. probably had his worst game of the year in in week four. There were a couple of things, but those couple of things to me look like communication issues and they all all involved Corey Graham. So you never know which way, whose fault it is and so forth. He was rarely just like beat real bad. So for Sidney Jones, the first three weeks, I think he only allowed something like 50 seven yards or in a like, you know, 0.2 yards per route run. And he's been uh, extra aggressive physical in the run game, even though it's like a smallish type of corner, he's been all over the place. And if you watch that Colts game at the end of the game, uh, two plays in a row, he saves a touchdown. So he, he's been absolutely a, a mm-hmm. monster for this team for, for most of the year. So I don't regret letting a, a okay. P Rob walk. Yeah. All right. So, so, you know, the problem seemed to be Jalen Mills and, and Ronald Darby. It's, it feels like Eagles fans are in particular angry at Jalen Mills. Uh, I think actually Solak again brought up that it's actually it might be both of them 
that are at fault in that not one is necessarily extraordinarily egregious versus the other. What is it? Why is it a problem? <laughs> and uh, why isn't Rasul Douglas playing? Yeah, a Rasul would be the the immediate thing that I think they would go to if they wanted to replace one of them. I thought Darby uh, for for three weeks uh, played pretty well. He was playing some some good football, and then they ask him to do something that he's not accustomed to do. So you have those deep routes, and Jalen Mills was playing for one of them that I believe got dropped, if I'm not mistaken. By I think it was uh, Taewon Taylor. Uh, it was Darby that had to squeeze his route a little bit more on that, but he was late to react to it because he's not used to reading it. People are criticizing these guys, not understanding the coverage concepts that they're being asked to do and, and not understanding whose job is what exactly just because he's the nearest defender. When the ball comes down, you've got Corey Graham 30 yards away. Well, maybe you should pour in at Corey Graham every now and then, but really uh, the blame for me, comes down to Jim Schwartz not putting his guys in a position to win. He knows the ball is going to come out quick. We're playing 10 yards off. People are upset that we're giving up the the curls and, and the easy stuff. And now we're giving up the deep stuff because we're asking corners to do safety jobs. And it's it's super weird. But Mills has struggled uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. But I think it's only half of what people are saying. Sure. Uh, so let's go back onto the defensive line. Brandon Graham, not producing a ton of sacks, producing a ton of pressure. It seems to be the story of his career. Fletcher Cox, producing the most pressure, I think, uh, of any interior player in the NFL. Uh, and then uh, some guys named Michael Bannon, Chris Long, and you know, whoever, right? Yeah. Uh, just, just tell me about this, this defensive line, where they win, where they need to kind of improve, whether or not it's like inside rushing stunts, defending the run, whatever. Uh, and, uh, and kind of what opponents have done to try and stop them and whether or not that's worked. Well, they're absolute demons against the run, and they do a really good job. Their ends do Barnett and Graham if, if they're unblocked of, of reading the play, sniffing it out, and making a play on the ball when they're trying to be, you know, and trying to manipulate them. Uh, what is fun about this front four? And I don't think there's really much anything that you can do against them other than get the ball out quick because there was, there was this uh, scenario that kind of encompasses what this defense is about and the problem that it presents to offenses. It was third down and nine for the Colts, right? So you've got a running back to the right and a tight end to the left. On the left side of the offensive formation, you've got Derek Barnett. Eric Ebron's going to chip him. The left tackle is going to take him. That's two players, right? So then at left guard the, and the center, they're going to slide towards Fletcher Cox. So that's another two players. So you got two players taking up two blockers and one's going to release light. So then your right guard is singled up against Michael Bennett. And then your right tackle and your halfback is going to chip on uh, Chris Long. So that's another two and you're releasing two guys late. So you've only got three downfield concepts happening and you can't run like those three wide receiver flood type concepts and all that stuff. And you're getting two guy, two guys on three of the defenders. The one on one with Michael Bennett is the one that got to Andrew Luck. <laughs> like you got you got seven guys helping in protection. And the one one on one matchup that you have wins. And that's a constant situation for this Eagles defense. They they know how Fletcher Cox can influence slide protections. They run their blitzes off that. They really trust it. And, and this defense, if they just get a little bit of time, man, they can absolutely be a be a home wrecker. And, and they're more sacks per year than they were getting last year, and the press rates are absolutely fine. So there's not a whole lot that this defensive line can't do. Uh, so Fletcher Cox uh, is kind of in the conversation with Aaron Donald, Geno Atkins, etc. Um, there's a lot of really good defensive tackles in the NFL right now, uh, or conversely, a bunch of really bad interior offensive linemen. Take your pick. Um, but it's both. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's probably both. Um, what distinguishes Cox from from some of these other players? And don't tell me he's better than Aaron Donald. But, you know, tell me maybe, you know, that he's better than peak Gerald McCoy or peak Geno Atkins uh, or, or whatever. What distinguishes him from, you know, this this incredible crop of, of interior defensive talent we have? Yeah, I'm not going to compare anybody to Aaron Donald. You don't have to worry about that for me, but I would put him in the stratosphere of Geno Atkins. And it's the violence, the precision, and his understanding of leverage when he uses his hands. And that first step, his ability, and the, and the full toolbox that he has, uh, whether he's forklifting or, or he's clubbing or whatever the case may be, he has that first step. And he's hitting you hard and he has a plan of attack and he's really good at understanding how the offensive lineman in front of him, uh, probably through film study, of course, is going to try to attack him and neutralize him. If you get him one on one, then it's a problem. And you think about it, too. I charted this in the first game with the Atlanta Falcons. Fifty two percent of the time 
he either got a slide with meaningful contact from a second player or just a straight up double team on passing plays. The, the, the attention that he commands, even when he's not making a play, he's freeing up other people to make a play in the Super Bowl. The Eagles knew that if they put Fletcher Cox on the right side of the center, that the center was going to slide that way. They could kick Brandon Graham in and he would get a one on one with Shaq Mason. They knew it. They knew exactly how they're going to deal with it. And Brandon Graham went and made the play. Fletcher Cox helped make that happen. So that's what Fletcher Cox brings to this defense. Instant disruptiveness, violence with his hands, first step quickness, and then the ability to help everybody around him look better. Okay. Where would you rank Cox uh, among interior defenders? Two? I three? I hate Rankins. Uh, uh, you got you got to do it, man. And, I, and I'm not talking about Sheldon Rankins, Bazinga. But I, I would <laughs> hey. I would tie him. I would tie him at two. I'm a big Geno Atkins fan. Okay. So uh, yeah, I, I would put him up there at two with Geno Atkins. I think that's fair. All right, uh, let's talk about linebackers. Uh, was it Texas guy Jordan Hicks? Right, he's from Texas. Yes, sir. Uh, Nigel Bradham, I think from Buffalo, uh, the professional team, not the school. Um, <laughs> What, what do you what do you feel about, about about this linebacker group? Because it felt like Nigel Bradham, when he was coming from Buffalo, was primarily kind of like a run stopping linebacker that should show up in base packages, but not in nickel packages. Um, but the Eagles, who have had a, a bunch of uh, I think kind of quality linebackers over the years, have found use for Bradham kind of all the time. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the two of them? Yeah, Bradham has been really good covering running backs out of the backfield and even playing some tight ends last year. He's been a bit rusty this year. They've trusted him a little, a little less, giving him less reps. When, when McLeod was healthy, they were running a lot of big dime on third down passing downs, leaving Jordan Hicks in there. So Hicks is kind of their coverage guy. Uh, Bradham is fantastic against the run. And he does enough in coverage and he's just, he's just smart. He just doesn't get beat in stupid ways. He's where he needs to be. And he's got the range to be able to stick with those guys too. So he's been a pleasant surprise as a coverage guy, but Hicks is the guy that you want on the field on third down covering, you know, your primary target. So I think they trust both of them. And then when they have to go to base, you know, Camus Grugier Hills, a younger guy is mostly a special teams guy, but he's very, very athletic. And he showed that off in the preseason um, a lot this year and, you know, earned him himself some playing time. So they have three linebackers that can legitimately cover running backs and tight ends. And that's, that's a huge bonus for a team, especially that's struggling in the secondary right now. Who do they bring onto the field when they go dime? Dime, it would have been Corey Graham would have been their third oh, right. safety. Yeah, yeah. And then right. now it is Avanti, uh, Avanti Maddox. They'll bring in with Corey Graham and Malcolm like Jenkins. Five, eight or something. Isn't he like tiny as hell? It's so weird. People were asking if we were going to move Mills to safety or Rasul to safety. And then they come out and they put Avanti Maddox out there. And I guess Jim Schwartz reasoning was, is that the nickel position has more similar reasons, similar uh, way of seeing things and, and moving than the outside cornerback position, which I kind of get. Yeah, yeah, I guess. But it was it was definitely a surprise, especially. I mean, yeah, like you said, he's like five, nine, 175 pounds. He's going to struggle with play strength if he has to come down in the box. But, you know, as a deep safety, he's quick and he's got some range and hit really his struggles for, for him are at the line. So maybe it makes sense. All right. Um, OK, so the Vikings have kind of this murderers row of two receivers, so not a very long row. Uh, of Adam Thielen, and Stephon Diggs. You are effusive in your praise of both Thielen and Diggs. <laughs> Uh, and I am going to let you kind of go off on them. Um, but tell me kind of who on the Vikings offense you think presents the greatest threat to the Eagles hopes of, of maintaining kind of a clean sheet. Yeah, it's, 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 it's Dixon and Thielen are the, they're really the only ones that I'm concerned about. I mean, the run game, I'm not concerned about. You guys aren't explosive there. You're like, I think like league low for four runs of 10 plus yards and a 30% success rate on first 10. That's also pretty bad. But the wide receivers, the, Adam Thielen, is a fantastic nuanced route runner throughout the entire from beginning to end of his route. The technique just pours out of this dude and he's not sneaky fast. He's like actually fast, fast. Like he's like one of the white dudes, a uh, wide receiver that can, <laughs> that can absolutely burn. Like you have to qualify that with him because otherwise people think he's slow, but no, Th Thielen has serious speed, serious nuanced technique to his game. And then, I mean, Stefan Diggs, I was talking about him on the timeline uh, the other day. I put up a, a mm -hmm. video of one of his routes he ran against the San Francisco 49ers. It was like an out and up and out and up. And then, and then, yeah, it's it like, uh, and then, someone in your replies called it a staircase route or something like that. It is really unique. I've heard like four different names for it. One of them was like a witch route because it's like a wheel hitch. It, it was like, it That's was a such a great name. Wow. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. No, I love that. Uh, Bets actually texted that to me. So I was like, oh, cool. Thanks. All oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, but but Diggs, I, th- I think I called him the stankiest route runner uh, in the game because he put so many different little nuances and, and moves. And, and he really is good at affecting uh, a defender's uh, leverage, their hips, getting them to turn, uh, making them think one thing is coming making everything look the same, but it's so active and it, and it just throws defenders off. It is very, very fun. And they're both pretty, you know, they're both sure handed. So they're both deep threats, but at the same time, they're three level threats. And that's what concerns you about them. Cause they'll pick you up part alive with the route running at the, at the, you know, the shallow routes, the intermediate routes and the deep routes as well. I think both of them, honestly, I think both of them are top 15 receivers in the NFL. You, you, so when you call Diggs the the stankiest route runner, the first thing that comes to mind to me is uh, is Stevie Johnson, right? Yeah. Which I mean, that guy gets compared to a bunch of receivers. It just happens, like Anquan Bolden, Stevie Johnson, Percy Harvin. These are these are just things that happen. Um, do you think that Diggs could have been a Revis killer, like uh, like Stevie Johnson was? You know, he re, he does kind of remind me of Stevie because of all the the different tools he has in his toolbox. Not only at the release point, but at the break point and throughout his route stem. I think he could absolutely, absolutely, uh, in that era, really challenge Darrell Rivas, which you cannot say about a lot of route runners. And, and those guys have to be absolutely detailed and and very good at their craft. And I think I think Diggs is up there. He's so there's both of them are so underappreciated. I saw Steve uh, um, Stephon Diggs on a, on a commercial today. I was like, it's about dog on time. I see his right? face on something He's outside. He's so charismatic too. You yeah. think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, same question uh, for for the defense as, as of the offense. What does a defensive failure look like? Does it look kind of like penalty? You brought that up for the offense. Does it just look like, hey, a bunch of quick throws that are happening uh, with, with receivers wide open, kind of like you've previewed? Uh, or does it look like something else? Does the defensive line finally get exploited? Do they have to be controlled for, for the offense to score like 35 points or whatever? What does it look like when the defense fails? Well, I'll, I'll say this. A win for the Vikings offensive line is just kind of holding steady. I, I don't yeah, think there's yeah. uh, something in the cards where they just like kind of like, wow, they really dominated this game. I don't I don't, I don't <laughs> yeah, think yeah, you know they, what I mean. <laughs> kind of agree they, there. Yeah. Yeah. They just got to kind of hang on just enough to give Kirk Cousins just enough time to run a little Literally bit more play hold. action. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you got to hold too. run, run, run some play action with some seven man protections and see what that deep ball is looking like early in the game. I think that's I think that's how you expose the Eagles as far as their coverage right now. They have not figured it out. They haven't figured it out what they're going to do with that. With what type of coverage team they're going to be now that Roddy McLeod is out. Jim Schwartz is lost right now when it comes to that. You have to be able to challenge them vertically down the field for the defense. For me, uh, the opposite would be, you know, get three guys deep play a soft cover shell, do the basic stuff like teams like the the Colts do. You know, they don't have all the talent right now. They don't have all the pieces. So they play a soft shell. They come up and they make the offense like the Eagles had to do against them, execute a 12 play drive, a, seven, a 17 play drive to march down the field. Put the onus on them to execute. Right now, I just don't trust this defense to not bust against the big play. Uh, they can be easily influenced by play action. They like to run blitz. So they're they're weak in the, in the back end in that way too. So a loss for them looks like, again, kind of like it did with the Titans, just getting beat deep. And the Titans could have had a lot more shots, too, like you mentioned. Jennings dropped one. Taylor dropped one. They could have had a pass interference on that call, too. And, uh, yeah, so that's what it looks like for me. All right. Two more football questions than one not football question. First football question, the Vikings are not good at running the ball. They have not, quote, unquote, established the run. Do you need to establish the run in order to be effective at play action? I no no you do not I, okay. I don't think you do and, and you know the, the, the I just this, said this is a debate on Twitter man I just you know <laughs> well I'll say this the, the the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence but so maybe there is something to that but mm-hmm. the the Vikings. I don't think I think they should abandon the run game and let the haters and losers of which there are many moan about it later, because I don't <laughs> think they need to waste plays trying to run the ball on this Eagles defense when the Eagles are at home. Like and and I do think that they should see an increase in their in their play action, too. Like uh, you don't need to be busting off five, six yards a clip. Like find me the data where that exists. I don't it, it just doesn't. So regardless, the Eagles should see, they still get influenced by uh, play action, despite the fact that nobody can run on them right now. So that's kind of your proof right there that you can still manipulate this defense with play action, be successful with them, even though they're so doggone good against the run. 
All right, second question. You've seen Kirk Cousins play the Eagles a lot. What are your hopes and dreams with regards to that matchup, and what are your nightmares with regards to that matchup? And can John DeFilippo uh, make those nightmares more possible? Hmm. Hmm. My dream, my dream would would they're about to get back in the game, and he has another another uh, clock management blunder, like he's had a couple of oh, times now. Right in the heart. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my nightmare is he, 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 he hits his deep like all game and he's just on mm-hmm. fire, which he's very capable of. He's very capable of that. Um, I have I have no uh, misgivings or uh, misunderstandings about, you know, what kind of caliber caliber player that, that Kirk Cousins can be when he's hot. He can be a high level player when he's hot. Feel like he's a streaky guy. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. He can. Yeah. He can put up 47 on you. He can put up 10 on you. Like it's, it all depends on the day of the week. And, and usually it's not Sunday, but hopefully it's not <laughs> Sunday <laughs> as an unnecessary shot. I like Kirk cousins. I don't have anything against him, but right. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just him being hot would be my nightmare. All right. Non football question. Uh, off air. We asked you about, or uh, we didn't even ask you, you know, we, my, so my uh, Norse code uh, Skype, um, picture is, is me looking kind of like Macho Man Randy Savage because I'm at the, the Seahawks game. It's like negative 20 out. Uh, so Closer I got like to negative 40, mask. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so I got, you know, the, the ski goggles on and stuff like that. This You brought up that you worked for uh, the late Macho Man Randy Savage for his subscription website, which I can only assume is called the Macho Mathletic. How was that? <laughs> uh, it was actually MachoMan.com. He was trying to get together like a like a, a paper pay per view type thing for for a website, so subscription based stuff. And ahead of his was, time, ahead, ahead of his time. Yeah, and it's I mean it's we still got a ways to go with time apparently to get to that point. But I was. I want to say 18 or 19 years old. I had dropped out of high school and I had taught myself how to uh, man, video edit. Man. And I was working on a uh, professional, a local independent wrestling company's uh, television show. I was uh, co-producing it and he was starting that, that site. So he, we were a local company, uh, Steve Kern school of wrestling, which at the time was like a farm school for the WWE was in that same area. So we came in and we filmed it there at that school. And we did that for about six months. And like I told you off the air, uh, so I was like camera guy and then I would edit stuff. I would put music to stuff and I would do, I would do all that fancy stuff. Um, and it was right around the time, like I was telling you, uh, when he put out his rap album, which was, you know, be a man Hulk and, and, and all that stuff. <laughs> So I remember Jimmy, Jimmy Del Rey, who was part of the heavenly bodies in the WWE. He was like a hangers on type of guy. And he was up in, up in the office. They had like this little suite upstairs or whatever. And he was like, Mikey, man, come listen to this. And, 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 you know, he, he put that song on before it had come out. I was like, what the hell is this? What's going on? That's, that's the opposite of somebody going, Hey, listen to this unreleased Prince track. <laughs> You're like, Hey, listen to this unreleased macho man rap album. <laughs> so the, the the funniest thing that Macho Man said to me, and he was a good guy. He was a really good guy. And he kind of has a sad story where he didn't have any real friends at the time and, and all this stuff. But we were outside and we and we're out in front. Uh, and he says to me, you know, Mikey, you know, brother, I really don't you know, when I go out, I really don't want people to know, you know, who, who I am. So I try to keep a real, you know, incognito. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Dig it right. Well, I mean, while he's saying this, I mean, this dude with a giant, he's unmistakable. Randy Savage is right, yeah. he's saying this. <laughs> As he's standing in front of this black Hummer that has a gigantic macho man, you know, like white spray paint thing <laughs> along the side of it. I'm like, yeah, Randy, you're playing it real cool. Brother. Yeah, the <laughs> only way that he could be playing it any more cool is if he uh, had like the, the, the Slim Jim logo just across yeah. the back of this stretch Hummer. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was that obvious. So yeah, he was a good dude, but man, he was he was a weirdo. But that was a fun six months. <laughs> he strikes me as a guy that might never break kayfabe. Is that he is exactly who he is on television? <laughs> right. Okay, good, excellent. There was no difference, <laughs> and then like. It, and, and what was it with the one time he was like, you know, because it was kind of like in a warehouse I mean, they had the big garage door. He's like, you know, Mike, we ought to close these garage doors one day, you know, and we're going to fill up these light canisters with weed, brother. Yeah, dig it. Yeah, I do it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so all the little ad libs and everything like that, he did that in real life. It was weird, man. That is <laughs> Con- constantly feeling like you're in a, a Mean Gene promo. That's awesome. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, Crazy experience. Picked up mic skills by osmosis, man. That's great. <laughs> 
all right well uh thanks so much for for coming on especially with those stories at the end phenomenal uh you might as well just give us like a score prediction i know you probably hit those two but go for it i'll go uh wow eagles defense is historically awesome at home i'm gonna go 27 27- yeah, I'm going to go 27-13 uh, Eagles. We need kind of a little – we need to get out in front early and have a, a little bit of a quasi good old-fashioned blowout like we had in uh, 2017 to calm this freaking fan base down. So that's kind of my wish and also my quasi prediction. All right. I'm, uh, I'm frankly – hold on. I'm frankly disappointed. You had <laughs> one chance to say that it was going to be 38-7. Uh, you know, <laughs> I already did that. I already did that to a reef the other day because, you know, I, I told him that the game was being played on October 7th, exactly 38 days removed from the last preseason game that the Eagles played. So there's there's your 38 seven reference. Yeah, no, he got me on his podcast. So I, I, I respect him for for keeping it to, I to the one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my, my prediction is 27, 24 Vikings. I've got no reason for it. I do think that the Eagles are a better team. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're away. I mean, it's just cause the Vikings defense hasn't figured it out. If they figured it out fine, they, they've got a good chance to win. Yeah. Um, but yeah, sure. Vikings win uh, by three points away. Um, but you know, obviously the, the second prediction is like 38, seven Vikings. Like that's, there's, it's beautiful. That's, that's, that's the best case that? scenario. Yeah. <laughs> like wait, what happens in that world? Oh man. A lot of violence. <laughs> <laughs> Those poor horses. Those poor, poor horses. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Speaking of, we got to talk about this uh, Viking statue that got pulled down. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. What? uh, You know exactly what you know what I'm talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you sound like, you know, come on, man. (laughs) Level with me, dude. (laughs) We just spent an hour talking about football. That's not. Come on. we, we, We hang out at the senior bowl. We're boys, man. Just tell me about this this thing. Are you talking about the thing that got dumped in the in the river? Yeah. Yeah. What's the deal with it? I don't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So we can we can determine that you definitely were not there on the night in question. Gotcha. Yeah, All that's, right. That's that's, that's correct. That, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, works yeah. for me. The worst part is if we contacted Philly police, we get nowhere. We have to take this national. <laughs> I, I like how this is this is the scoop. This is this is how we get into the big time. All right, that, that works. Oh, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, no recollection whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dude, uh, thanks so much for coming on. This was uh, a blast. Uh, tell Ben, I'll, I'll tell him you're better than him. Uh, mm. That's cool. True. Um, uh, well, I meant I meant Natan, but yeah, sure. Select. Both. Yeah. yeah, both. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, and hopefully we'll be having this conversation in January. Yeah. Uh, why don't you go ahead and, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, plug your website, too? Oh, yeah. BleedingGreenNation.com. So and if you put that into iTunes, Bleeding Green Nation, you'll see all of our podcasts there. You can follow that on that account on Twitter at BGN underscore radio. Follow me on Twitter at Michael Kist NFL. That's K-I-S-T. But don't because I don't really care about followers and I don't like most of them. But there's my plug. <laughs> oh, you, you really are an Eagles fan, aren't you? <laughs> I don't like the hassle, man. I don't like the hassle. I don't like people all in my business. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. That was uh, that was a lot of fun. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. All right, that was uh, that was pretty awesome. Not every guest we have uh, on the show has a uh, Randy Savage story, so I feel like we should uh, moving forward we should make sure right, that yeah. all of That'd our guests. That'd be a guests, good rule to have. Yeah, yeah, just have some sort of association with Randy Savage. I feel like that's the best way to go about this. Uh, let's go to the mailbag. Ian, uh, wants to start off with some dusty hate. I'm totally fine with this. Uh, though not quite what he predicted, Dalvin is hurt. Why does Dusty O'Connell have to be this way? This is all his fault. Clearly no false equivalencies here. (laughs) I, uh, I, I can't disagree with any of the statements, uh, but I, I can't also answer the question. I don't know why he has to be that way, but he just is. Just a hateful, hateful man. That is, uh, that, that's, that's my take. I feel like I've known him longer than, <laughs> than most, so. Right, yeah. Yes, uh, yes, definitely just a, just a hateful, hateful human being. Uh, Corey Ruge asks, how is Linval doing? I don't hear his name much and assume he's playing at a reasonable level, or is his performance sneakily contributing to the smoking dumpster in our collective living room? 
Uh, so that's actually a pretty good question. The problem is that, so yeah, Linval has been kind of uh, absent, which is difficult to evaluate because he's a nose tackle that are kind of historically absent. And at the same time, the Vikings defensive line is actually doing a, a decent job of getting pressure. I know uh, that, that Mike mentioned that after a 50% pressure rate week one, they've kind of dropped off to 33%. Uh, it should be noted that 33% against Jared Goff is pretty good because historically the first three weeks, he only received pressure on 22% of his drop back. So, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, a push and pull there. Um, but Linval himself has not been contributing to that pressure, which is unusual for him. He normally does a pretty good job putting pressure on the quarterback for a nose tackle. He typically ranks sort of in the top five among nose tackles in pressure rate. And right now he ranks kind of around 40, actually. Um, so in the passing game, he hasn't been contributing as much as he typically does. In the running game, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to kind of tell because it's not so easy to kind of use statistics to try and determine his individual impact. But I would say for the most part, he hasn't been doing as much, but it's not a concern. I think that uh, he's a little bit below his normal level of performance as a run defender, um, but not enough that you know one would say that there's a serious problem there. All right. Next question is from OPM, who asks, how much of the loss of Tony of uh, Tony Sperano could be contributing to the Vikings O-line woes? They struggled at times under him, but without him, they have been abysmal. That's uh, another really good question. I wish I could answer it. Uh, it's, you know, not quantifiable. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there's a reason they went after Sperano instead of, uh, you know, Clancy Barone and, and, and the assistant offensive line coach, I mean, because Sperano is more expensive. They, they clearly felt, uh, that whatever he provided was worth it. So, uh, there's, there's kind of a lot there. Um, and I would say, uh, probably a, a fair amount, especially because, you know, we've seen kind of this drop off in, in play quality from Riley Reef. We kind of expected more from him. Uh, you know, maybe one of the reasons that, that Brian O'Neill isn't seeing the field is because he's not developing as quickly. Maybe, you know, uh, Sprano's death might be a factor in that. Uh, it is really difficult to tell to kind of figure out specifically kind of what the the problems are. Uh, but in the abstract, certainly, you know, the Vikings offensive line seems worse, right? Or it substantially is worse. Uh, and, and some of that might have to do with like injuries, but you know, some of it might have to do with, with not having, uh, you know, the coach available to you that you wanted and kind of the emotional toll it takes, uh, to see someone that was close to close to you die. So all of those things might, might, might play a role. All right. Next question is from uh, Kenneth Allen, who says, uh, does the use of a roster spot on Everson Griffin bode well for his potential return? Couldn't the team reach out for a roster exemption for him, given the circumstances, if they expected him to miss uh, some significant time? Uh, maybe. I'm not sure kind of what how that process would work for an NFI situation. They certainly wouldn't look for a commissioner's list exemption because that seems to be used. Well, I mean, it was really only used uh, notably one time. I think it was used one other time, but really only used in a situation where uh, some form of disciplinary action seemed necessary, but without the kind of the full facts to bear that they, they couldn't impose in actual suspension. Uh, and so, I mean, it's the reason that, you know, Adrian Peterson wasn't allowed to play, but was allowed to collect a salary. Uh, this isn't really a situation where disciplinary action is called for. So trying to kind of, um, you know, cut the difference between the two isn't really an appropriate solution here. So uh, for a non-football injury, which is what this is being classified as, uh, I, I, you, you don't want to put him on IR. You don't want to cut a salary for sure, um, if possible. Um, so it might just be that the Vikings don't know what to do. And, and maybe that's why, but on the other hand, it's, it's, it can only be a neutral or a good thing, right? That they haven't tried to find a way to, to free up his, his roster spot. So I would say, you know, there's, there's a reason to be kind of optimistic about that fact, but you know, I wouldn't kind of bank on it or anything. Uh, also from Kenneth Allen, uh, what do you think the Vikings will take from the NFC Championship game? Arif has been really down uh, on the NFC Championship game being a matter of Zimmer being figured out. Assuming that's right and it's not a particular scheme issue, what should we expect different from him in this game? Just better execution? Uh, I mean, hopefully, right? It's it's difficult to ask that after, you know, we've seen subsequent defensive failures for, you know, uh, two games plus, you know, the first half of the first game or, or the second game. Um, yeah, it is, it is tough to try and, and, and figure out sort of like, 
you know, if discipline is the answer, you know, the Vikings have kind of moved backwards, not forwards. Right. Uh, and so maybe you could take a look at it. Obviously, you know, they talked to John D. Filippo and found out kind of the ways that they were exploited. That seemed to lead to new ways to be exploited by uh, the by the McVeigh Shanahan School of Offensive Coordinators. So, uh, yeah, maybe, you know, uh, our guest, Michael, mentioned that. Uh, Harrison Smith, you know, they picked on him in ways where they knew kind of the reasons that he was good is because, you know, he liked to to act certain ways against certain looks. And, you know, they, they took advantage of that, you know, obviously don't do that. Right. But like uh, that, that just seems to be kind of one particular example uh, of an issue that showed up. The players just kind of didn't play well. I don't think that you know, you already mentioned in the question, you know, I don't think that the, uh, the, the scheme was, was figured out as much, at least kind of in the same way that we saw happen in the Rams game. Uh, I think it's just more making sure that the rules that they use, the coverage rules to determine what their assignments are and how they should act, uh, that those shouldn't be so easily figured out. I wouldn't be surprised if they spent in the next 10 days uh, after the Rams game up until the Seagulls game uh, kind of changing what their coverage rules are. Also from Kenneth Allen, he asks, what do you guys think of Gritty? And if you had to get a tattoo of a creepy mascot, who would you choose and where would you get it? <laughs> Boy, that's a uh, – why exactly do hockey teams have mascots? Uh, I think Gritty is amazing. Um, I also think like all mascots are kind of creepy. So uh, – I, I guess maybe that's part of the uh, part of the nature of gritty. Like, there's no reason for him to be there in the first place anyway, which makes it all the funnier that he's like horrifying. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I don't know. Um, I like uh, I like the the old um, New Orleans Pel- Pelicans. Uh, was it the King Cake Baby or whatever it is? Oh God, that yeah. That yeah, uh, that tattoo, uh, somewhere uh, terrifying. No, not somewhere terrifying. <laughs> but yeah, you know, some, somewhere that like you Trans know if stamp. I had to, yeah right yeah somewhere where if I had to quit football and and work uh, in uh, at a retail or a fast food job or something like that where where they care about like tat- showing tattoos and appearance somewhere where that wouldn't disqualify me from the job. Um, so probably, uh, you know, my rib cage. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that would belong in your pack. Uh, well, <laughs> just like right on your chest. <laughs> you know, your, uh, your dad used to teach at UND. Do you remember the, uh, the UND bleacher creature that was a mascot there for a little while? No. Oh, no. Should I? Uh oh. I'm going to Google this right now. Yeah, the, so uh, the University of North Dakota had a uh, had a mascot for a little while, and uh, at the time it was the UN, uh, UND Fighting Sioux. Well, they decided not to go that route for a uh, mascot because that could Holy that crap. could be ridiculously what racist. The? So instead, in 1994, uh, <gasps> or it was like 92 to 94, um, the University of North Dakota came up with the Bleacher Creature. Sponsored by Super America. Oh my god! It's uh, it's the it's the stuff of nightmares, quite frankly. Uh, big green suit, purple eyebrows, nose, and tongue, and it was just yeah. The tongue is just lolling out. That's incredible. So that that would totally be for me uh, if I were physically capable of having a tattoo. Uh, I would put that in. Uh, that would put that on like my calf. They absolutely should have brought that back, first of all, and made that instead of the Fighting Hawks, which is a terrible name. <laughs> you, you just the, the Fighting Bleacher Creatures? Yeah. yeah the, well, I mean, just the UND Bleacher Creatures. That's it. You know, uh, not fight. No okay. one needs to fight. <laughs> the guy, a guy having his tongue out like that clearly yeah. isn't trying to start a fight. Right. He, yeah. he needs a place to sleep it off. <laughs> Thunder the Bleacher Creature. That uh, phenomenal. I went to I remember seeing him in person exactly one time and that was enough. I a friend had tickets to uh, a basketball game in like 1993 1994 and I remember watching this 7 foot behemoth walking around throwing t-shirts at people and and giving hugs to kids and me just looking Ugh. at the friend just going not a chance in hell. <laughs> there is no way. 
They should have leaned in, man. <laughs> um, let's go to uh, Kyle Siegel, who asks, is it just me or does Arif come off as oddly optimistic about our defensive woes? Do I? I mean, like... Well, you were defending uh, Anthony Barr last show. Saying well, the defense is everyone else is bad. That's not that <laughs> optimistic. Well, I, I think it, it was something along the lines of uh, he's been crap, but he's not, you know... He, he's not the he's not the worst smell out there right yeah like my defense was like well eric hendrix is like way worse like that that's not optimism at all man uh yeah i mean there's ways to like fix it right and we know that uh the defense has the talent to be good and we also uh could at least strongly suspect that it's like pretty unlikely that the zimmer is just like done as a person who can design and call defenses um or at least design them i mean i know a lot of people are talking about you know changing who calls defenses but i think it's unlikely that like this is it right he'll probably figure it out um but i mean like everyone is playing really badly and it's really difficult like Sometimes the solution is like really simple, right? Like, oh, uh, we're not getting enough pressure. Uh, and you've got kind of this guy who is a third down super sub who has the ability to get pressure, make him like start so you can get pressure more often. Like that, sometimes like that, it could be a, sol- a solution as simple as that. But like, you know, you can't be like, well, Xavier Rhodes isn't playing up to snuff. Let's uh, start Holton Hill. Like, that's obviously not the answer. So, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. Um, Maybe I'm optimistic. I I do think they'll turn it around. So I guess that counts as optimism. But like most of my discussion is just like, yeah, the defense is like the worst in the league against play action. That's really complicated and difficult to solve. Next. (laughs) Uh, Affect or effect says Arif and James, if the Vikings were an emo song, which would they be and why? I I have one prepared for this in case uh, you were. In case you were not prepared. Yeah, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't even see that one. So, yeah, I'm not prepared at all. Uh, but my guess is, uh, I, you know, I'm just going to make up a, a name of an emo song that it sounds like an emo song. Uh, waiting for the Black Heart of December. That sounds right to me. That sounds like a chemical romance uh, song. That makes sense. Yeah. I was going go. with the Sugar We're Going Down by uh, by Fall oh, Out Boy. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. This, that's good. This, this is. Well, the thing is, if this is if this was a team that had at least like one ring. You could have gone with thanks for the memories, but you can't. The you memories can. all suck. <laughs> if we were Eagles fans, we right. could <laughs> right. we could do that and, you know, go go home and punch our horses. But no, that's that's not what we can do here. We, we could just go with like any Hawthorne Heights song because there's just like unmitigated screaming in the middle of it. So that, I mean, that's, the, <laughs> that's right. usually when the offensive line uh, lets in three sacks in a row. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Don from Ohio has something to point out. He says Kyle Sloter being deactivated every game. Vikings are one, two and one. Coincidence? <laughs> well, he says no. He answered his own question because, of course, he did. Uh, I'm going to say, uh, come on, dude. <laughs> He's got to be on brand. Uh, also, yeah, yeah. Uh, gingers, do they bring anything productive to society? We had a good answer to this, which was that we'd have nobody to make fun of uh, <laughs> if it weren't for gingers. Um, I don't know. I've dated given, a, I dated a ginger. That was a poor life choice. Oh, wow. Rough. Uh, given how much consternation Carson Wentz has personally caused me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and how much I think that's where you're going with this. Well, I mean, that's the only logical direction, right? It's equals week. Um, <laughs> and given how much uh, disdain, not disdain, but antipathy, antipathy I have for Andy Dalton. Um, the other Carson was a ginger too, right? Carson Palmer. I think he was a ginger. Um, yeah. You know, uh, the evidence suggests no. <laughs> I mean, and and Ben Natan is no uh, is no prize oh, either. Oh yeah, so. oh, put him in the trash! Wow, wow, <laughs> that's three for three, plus Carson Palmer. Oh God, I'm crying. Uh, Alex Gobel asks thoughts on tuna. Uh, tuna is really good, man. You get, like a nice tuna steak is phenomenal. Uh, get it pretty rare. That's great. Tuna sushi is great. Um, tuna sushi is especially great. Yeah. Uh, fatty tuna uh, sushi is like really delicious. Apparently, that's like a super uh, American thing in Japan. There's like a different kind of tuna that they prefer. Whatever. I'm sure it's also delicious and I would love it too. Uh, 
tuna salad, it, I can see why people kind of get revolted by that. Mm-hmm. And I have been revolted by that. Yep. But also, like, once I decided to, like, make it myself with not even, like, fresh tuna, but, like, the packet tuna instead of the canned tuna, like the albacore in the packet, and just making it myself, it was actually delicious. So, yeah, it, I, I just think it's, like, bad preparations of tuna yeah, that, for I, the most part. If I'm uh, if I'm grilling it, I, I tend to like it. Oh I, yeah, Gr- um, Man, grilled is so good. I was gonna say grill grilled's really good, and then when I uh, if I do a like, all right, so tuna melt. Uh, are you a celery person or a pickle person? Uh, well, so I'm not huge into into either of those things generally. I think for a tuna melt, I'd want pickles. See, and I'm uh, I'm a celery person for that. I'm not uh, I the, I can do the pickle thing, but it's it's just one additional flavor that didn't need to be there, in uh, in my opinion. Although uh, it's not the you worst. Do, you could do like a milder pickle, and that probably resolves like a cornichon or something like that. Yeah, maybe, um, especially because the pickles we tend to have uh, around are like baby dills or something like that. So the additional like vinegar on that's probably the problem. Uh, I did, uh, I nearly got married to this woman. Uh, she used to put tuna in her mac and cheese. And I'm that's, not feeling that. That's, that's uh, a crime that's, against nature. That's like a red flag at the very least. That's like, that's in the top 20 reasons why she and I never like didn't make it. Um, yeah. I'm the guy who defended anchovies on pizza and pineapple on pizza the last episode. And this, I'm just like, that's a bridge too far. And she wouldn't throw it out. Like it would stay over because I wasn't going to touch oh, that. Oh God. So like overnight <laughs> that would, that would stay in the pot in the kitchen and like you'd, you'd oh, walk by it like afterwards. In the and, oh my God. No, that, 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 that might've been in the top 20 reasons as to why that, that didn't end up working out. But yes, it used to be tuna in mac and cheese. And that is a bridge too far for me. Not a uh, not a fan, but we do get to end with a with something we do like uh, with the weather changing and everything. Uh, Peter Lissy asks, what are your favorite fall foods? Uh, I love butternut squash soup, uh, especially with uh, some sour cream or uh, if you're pretentious enough, creme fraiche, which uh, I think especially in butternut squash soup uh, is really good. In case you're uh, curious, Arif is, in fact, pretentious enough for that. I mean, it's delicious, man. Uh, I, I will also say, like, sometimes people put it in places where just sour cream would be a little bit better. Not that there's a huge difference between the two. Um, uh, with uh, with cinnamon, nutmeg, especially nutmeg. Uh, and, uh, you know, you could do paprika. I also just like uh, roasting um, squash and then halfway through putting in, like, uh, rice with chicken stock and, and mushrooms and stuff like that. It's delicious. Um, and then uh, wild rice soup, which uh, can also be a fall thing, uh, can also be a winter thing, honestly. Yeah. This tends to be the time of year where my apartment uh, and like whole complex ends up smelling like uh, slow cooked apples. So there's a lot of like crock pot apple stuff that uh, I end up uh, doing this time of year. So uh, whether it's like because you can make even like in a crock pot, you can make like a like a like an apple cobbler or you can actually do slow cooker like baked apples that are really, really, really good. Uh, for whatever reason, the you, know, you, you get the whole uh, pumpkin spice thing uh, for, I, I say, like the basic white girl uh, thing, just because that's what uh, I keep hearing from people. Mm-hmm. Uh, people use the, you know, people younger than I say the word basic, so I'm just going to start co-opting it, and so thus I'll be younger by like association, right? Right. So basic girls seem to enjoy that. Uh, and I think the basic guy version of that is the like apple cinnamon or like the, the apple part of that. So I, I really enjoy the uh, like the slow cook apple like stuff. Um, and then and especially when it's getting to this time of year, uh, chicken tortilla soup as a oh, yeah, as a, as a way of kind of warming up the first day that it hit like 30 here. I was like, oh, God, my bones are cold. <laughs> let's. <laughs> Let's 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 reevaluate my life choice and you know where I live uh, and and toss something on here to uh, to light my mouth on fire and kind of get things back to where they're supposed to be. So that's what I'm thinking anyway. So that is going to be it for this episode. We will be back next week and to talk about the hopefully uh, the victory over the Eagles. Uh, Arif, what do you have to plug this week? All right, so I just wrote a piece uh, at the Athletic, kind of debunking sort of the most common. 
uh, I think myths that Vikings fans have been have been saying about the Vikings defense uh, that includes stuff about Anthony Barr and you know the pass rush and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, I've also got an Eagles preview going up uh, hopefully tomorrow morning. All right, so look forward to that. Uh, that is going to be it for this episode. If you have enjoyed this and would like to donate to the show, you can do so in one of two different ways. You can go to patreon.com slash Norse code, or you can go to paypal.me slash Norse code. Uh, we will be back next week to talk about the Eagles game. So for Arif, my name is James. Thank you guys so much for listening. And please remember to tweet that, even if it is a work in progress. And we will see you next week. Norse code is the largest and only division of Norse code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's Vikings blog at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan, and he can be found on Twitter at Arif Hassan NFL. I am your producer and co-host, and my name is James Pagoshnik. You can find me at the show's official Twitter feed at NorseCodeDN. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, you can make your one-time donation at paypal.me slash norsecode, or a recurring monthly contribution can be made by visiting patreon.com slash norsecode. Any questions or comments that won't fit in a tweet can also be sent to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. On behalf of the Norse Code staff, we thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. We go out... We hit people in the mouth. <laughs>